Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. All right. Let's take it from the top again. Places. Action. Well, let's see. We have on the bags. We have who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find I out. I say who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. Are you the manager? Yes. You're going to be the coach, too? Yes. And you know the fellow's name? Well, I should. Well, then who's on first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first baseman. Who? The guy playing first. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell That's me. That's it. That's who? Yes. Join us for another voyage back in time on Classic Radio Rewind. From adventures to westerns, from comedy to sci-fi, this is your ticket to theater of the mind. Without any further ado, here's your host for Classic Radio Rewind, Barry Slinker. Thank you so much, Mr. Dexro, and I welcome you to another edition of Classic Radio Rewind. Classic Radio Rewind is a two-hour journey, or rewind, if you will, back to the golden age of radio. As Dexro mentions at the beginning of each episode, the theater of the mind. This week's two-hour journey takes us back to a time when radio was king and was the only in-home form of media at the time. Later, we will hear an episode from the Bickersons from 1951. Then we wrap up hour number two with a Rocky double feature, including Rocky Fortune from 1954 and Rocky Jordan from 1950. But starting off this week, we're going to hear from Gunsmoke. After treating a wounded man, Doc gives his word of honor not to reveal the identity or hiding place of the killers. So, from January 10th, 1953, this is Gunsmoke starring William Conrad as Marshal Matt Dillon in The Word of Honor. Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Not up there, Mr. Dillon. He's just plain vanished. There's no note anywhere. You sure of that, Chester? Nothing, sir. I looked again all over. Well, it's two days now. This isn't like Doc. Well, I still think he's just gone off on an emergency. Out in the country somewhere. Maybe, but he's always left word before. Mm. Well, what do we do, Mr. Dillon? I don't know. Might start asking people, Chester. Uh, Try the saloons and the store and maybe... Maybe the depot, huh? All right, Mr. Dillon, I'll go right now. All right. Well, well, I do declare. What? Riding right up Front Street as big as life. Oh, that old rascal getting us all worried about him. For land's sake, you sure are a sight for sore eyes, Doc. Where in the world have you been at, anyway? Here. Hello, Chester. Matt? Well, you had us worried, Doc. That's so? You've been gone two days. I know. Next time, leave word, Doc. I will. I surely will. If I can. Well, it'd sure save us a lot now, of Now, wait a minute, wait general. a minute. Well, well, what do you mean, Doc, if uh, you can? Just that. If they let me, I'll leave word. Come on inside, Doc. Well, all right, I'm curious, Doc. You want to tell me about it? I can tell you part of it, the least important part. I made a promise about the rest. You know how it is, Matt. No, but you tell me. Well, 
The other night, Wednesday it was, I was peacefully asleep on my couch when a couple of riders tromped right into my office. They said a man was hurt somewhere out past Fort Dodge, so naturally I got up and I went along with them. Well, then why didn't you leave a note and say so? They didn't tell me exactly where we was going, Chester. But they sure told me not to leave any note. They told you what? Let him talk, Chester. Now, of course, I figured then it must have been a shooting, but my job's to take care of everybody, sinner and saved alike. And so, when finally we got to this place the next day... What place? <sighs> that's part of what I promised not to tell, Chester. But like I was saying, there was a young man there who got himself shot in the back. The bullet lodged right in his spine. And I dug it out, and I did all I could for him. And then I just sat there for quite a spell. And then I put my things away. And I walked out into the other room. So, well, Doc, how is it? I did what I could. What do you mean? He's dead. The shock of extracting that bullet was too much for him. It's a bad place to spy in there. You killed him, huh, Doc? No. No, I didn't kill him. He's dead, ain't he? Look, mister, doctors don't kill people. Murderers Watch do. your mouth, Doc. That boy wouldn't have lived more than a couple of days with that bullet where it was. And whoever put it there murdered him. You want me to shut him up? Not yet. Doc, tell me something. You know that boy in there? I do. Sure. And the three of us here, you know any of us? Uh, him. I've seen him around somewheres. Dodge, I guess. Well, that settles it. He ain't walking out of here. Shut up. Know his name, Doc? No. No, I don't. Of course, it might come to me. Let me think now. now you I... don't understand, Doc. He wants to kill you already. Now you're trying to remember his name. That's just going to make it worse. You can't kill a doctor for following his oath? Oh, no. I shot that boy when he tried to get away, and I shoot you just as Don't easy. be a fool. I'm a doctor. And since there's nothing more I can do here, I've got to be available to other patients. I've been away too long. Oh, what are we part. arguing about? The sooner we shoot him, the better. What kind of a man are you, anyways? Don't you know I'm the only doctor within a hundred miles of Dodge? Right now, it's one too many. Now, wait a minute. I'm kind of thinking the doc's right. He ain't like an ordinary man. But doctor... Well, it's almost like he ain't quite human somehow. He's human enough to tell what he knows that hard-headed marshal they got in Dodge. Then we'll have him on our tail, we'll never get our 20000 Uh-uh. Well, I figure it's us or the doc. I'm not interested in what you figure, mister. Right this minute, there may be some woman having a baby and needing me real bad. There may be several folk needing me for help. He's right. We can't kill him. I can't. You'll do what I say and nothing else, here. Oh. Doc, listen to me. If I let you go, will you promise not to tell about anybody you recognized here? And if I don't, then doctor or no doctor, I'll kill you myself. Yeah, I suppose you would. All right, I'm here as a doctor and nothing else. I promise. Word of honor, Doc? That's my word of honor. Okay, get out. One other thing, Doc. What? You break your word, you tell anybody where this place is or who you saw here, and we'll get to you. We'll kill you no matter where you try to hide. I gave you my word, didn't I? Sure, but don't forget what I said anyway. Don't forget for one minute. We'll kill you or die trying. That's quite a story, Doc. And you played it right smart, if you ask me. Who were they, Doc? Well, tell us. Well, I only recognized one of them, Chester. Besides the man they'd shot. So you said. Uh, have you thought of his name no, yet? Oh, Chester, you don't understand. I, I gave him a word I wouldn't tell. Yes, but that was just so as you could get away. Well, they'd have shot me for sure otherwise, but... Still, I gave my word. It don't matter how or why. But, Doc, they're just a bunch of killers. I know. Leave him alone, Chester. But, Mr. Dillon... Yes, sir. Matt. Yeah, Doc. Wouldn't you do the same if you were in my boots? 
That'd be a hard choice, Doc, but... Yeah, I suppose I would. Why, any man would. Leastwise, any man of honor would. Well, I guess I wasn't really thinking about it that way. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to get some sleep. Uh, uh, Matt, that was a good boy they murdered. I, uh, I hope they hang for it. Oh, Dad blasted him. How are we ever going to find him, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. We don't even know who they killed. Funny, we haven't heard about it. Maybe nobody's missed him yet. Just think. Doc could lead us straight to him right now. Well, it isn't making the Doc happy, Chester. No, sir, it sure isn't. I'm going over the Texas Trail, Chester. I'll be back later. Yes, sir. Hey, Sam, bring me over a bottle and a glass, will you? Sure, Marsh. Hello, Matt. Oh, hi, Kitty. You want some help with that bottle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm only going to have one. You can finish it. Sit down. Oh, my reputation's bad enough without my trying to get around carrying a bottle of whis- bit of whiskey in me. <laughs> there you be. Oh, thank you, Sam. There you are, Kitty. Well, here's to luck. Yeah, I could use some. <clears throat> well, you didn't come here to drink a bottle of rye, man. What's on your mind? Well, Kitty, I was sort of wondering if uh, maybe you'd heard any talk about uh, anybody being missing lately. Missing? Who? <laughs> well, that's, that's just the point. I I, I don't know who. <laughs> Well, you're sure not on much of a trail, are you, Matt? Well, a man was shot and he's dead. And I don't know who he was or who did it or where. All I know is that it happened. Well, I'll be darned. Well, Matt, I don't know a thing I've heard that it helped. I'm sorry. Oh, it was just a chance. You know, it's not often a man gets shot around here without everybody knowing about it. <laughs> well, I'm glad for that much anyway. <laughs> well, thanks, Kitty. Well, good luck, Matt. Yeah, take it easy with that bottle. Yeah, I'll save it for you. So long. See you, Matt. Doc has been asleep for six straight hours, Mr. Dillon. He sure must have been tired. <sighs> yeah. Uh, here, Chester, take these letters down to the depot for me, will you? They gotta be in Washington next week. Santa Fe pulls out in an hour, sir. I'll put them right in the mail car. Marshal? Why, Jake Worth, why, you haven't come into Dodge in the last six months that I know of. I'm here now, Marshal. Oh? Uh, Trouble, Jake? I'd call it that. Well? You know that cottonwood, the big one down at Brandy Bend? Yeah. There's a hole cut down by the roots at the north side of it. I put a sack in that hole this morning. It's got $20,000 in it. That's a lot of money, Jake, even for you. It isn't if Hank gets back all right. Hank? That's your youngest boy, isn't it, Jake? Yeah, 18 last month. Yeah. And that's ransom money. Your boy's been kidnapped, huh? He didn't show up the other night, Marshal. Next morning, I found a note tacked on the corral. Said to leave the money or they'd kill him. Oh, come on, Jake. We'll try to get there before they pick up the money. No, Marshal, I won't take any chances. They'd shoot him sure if we did that. You should have told me before you left the money. You should have come here first, you know. You didn't hear what I said, Marshal. I won't take the chance. All I want now is for you to watch for anybody who turns up rich around here. Jake, I want you to listen to me. You listen to me, Marshal. Nobody's going to do a thing till Hank's back safe on the ranch. Not 
one dang thing. Jake, if they killed Hank, you'd want him hung, wouldn't you? I'll hang him myself if it comes to that. I'll hunt him down like wolves. All right, then let's go. Let's get on to Brandy Ben and wait for him. No. I already told you no. Hank's dead, Jake. Huh? They already shot him. And he's dead. What are you talking about? Where is he? I don't know. And how come you know he's dead? I, I, I can't tell you. Marshal, I've had about enough of this. We're wasting time here. Come on, Jake. I'll tell you what I can on the way to the river. You better by heaven or one of us ain't never gonna get to the river. Jake Worth was known as a hard, hot-tempered man, but he was straight as they come. He'd made one fortune in Texas cattle and another in buffalo hides, and now all he wanted was his ranch and his three sons to work it with him. The worst were good men. They didn't cause any trouble, and they worked hard. It was hard to tell Jake, but without mentioning Doc, I said what I could. And when we reached the Arkansas, we hid our horses in the clump of bush and worked our way on foot up to the big cotton, way on foot up to the big cottonwood. And then I saw it. And I stood up and walked out into the open. What are you doing, Marshal? You gone crazy? Come on, Jake. No use to hide now. Oh. That's him there, isn't it? That's Hank? I'm afraid so, Jake. And they killed him. They killed him all right. He was a good boy. Had his whole life to live yet. Why did they do it? I gave him the money. Why did they do it? I... I'm sorry, Jake. <sighs> Marshal, I've been kind of confused by all this. I swallowed your story on the way down here. But I want the truth now. Every bit of it. That's all I know, Jake. Hank tried to break and went up and shot him. But we'll get him. I'll take care of myself as soon as you tell me who they are. I don't know who they are. Don't lie to me, Marshal. You know a lot you're not telling me. What's going on with you anyway? I've told you all I can, Jake. That's my boy lying there, Marshal. He's been murdered. And if I didn't know you so well, I'd begin to think maybe you had something to do with now, it Now, just yourself. a minute, Jake. I know you're then, upset. Then why don't you tell me? Because the man who told me about it had to promise not to name anybody. That's why. What man? Who is he? I'll, I'll get it out of him if, if I have to cut it out. Yeah, I know. That's why I can't tell you who he is. What kind of a lawman are you, anyway? I've told you all I can, Jake. No. No, you haven't. Marshal, I don't believe your story about nobody. You promise nothing. You know who done it. And you're going to tell me or don't I'm... Don't try it, Jake. You can't kill me and you know it. No. Nope. I can't. Me and my boys can. And I'm giving you 24 hours to name those men and then we're coming to Dodge. There'll be blood spilt, Marshal. Jake, I give you my word, I don't know who did it. I don't believe you. I'll help you take your boy home now. Oh, no. You go on back to Dodge. I'll manage here. You're making a bad mistake, Jake. 24 hours, Marshal. I'll be there. We'll find you wherever you'll be. Jake, I want... So long, Jake. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, 300,000 volunteers are needed for the Ground Observer Corps. This spare time activity serves as a vital supplement of the Air Defense Command radar network, 
which has certain unavoidable blind spots due to the curvature of the earth. Men and women from teenage up are urged to become ground observers. Get in touch with your nearest civil defense center. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. There was no use arguing with him. The man's grief had destroyed his reason. And the worst of it was, I knew his sons would do whatever Jake told him to do. Unless I could stop it somehow, I'd have to shoot it out with three good and perfectly innocent men. For no reason at all. I thought about it all the way back to Dodge, and by the time I got there, I had an idea. I went up to Doc's and talked it over with him. Well, all right, Matt. I'll, I'll do whatever I can. It might not work, Doc, and you'll be exposing yourself to a lot of danger. Have you thought about that? I have. I've also been thinking about the men who killed Hank with. Well, we could wait till they start spending their money or till one of them gets drunk and maybe talks too much somewhere. We could. But meantime, you and the worst will have a gunfight. Oh, man, it'd be a terrible thing to let happen... All right, then, Doc, let's go. I want to get to the ranch before dark. Yeah, maybe Jake's cooled off by now. Enough not to start shooting on sight, anyway. Uh, we'll soon find out. Come on. <laughs> you know, Matt, I haven't been out here since Mrs. Worth died. Oh, that must be four or five years ago. Well, the place sure has changed, hasn't it? Yeah. I don't see anybody around, do you? Maybe they saw us first. Maybe they're hit out. I hope not. See, Matt, I got an idea. Why don't you take your gun off and hang it around your saddle horn? Then they'll know you come peaceable. I can't take a chance like that, Doc. Not with Jake in his state. But I won't shoot unless I have to. He who lives by the sword. Look, Doc, I'm doing everything I can to avoid this thing. But I'll kill all three of them if I have to. All right, Matt, I understand. That's far enough, Marshal. Watch him, boys. If he makes a move, shoot. Yes, sir. Jake, I came here to stop a shooting, not to start one. You can stop it, Marshal. Just tell me who killed my son. If I knew I'd be on his trail, Jake. I'm not sure of that at all. What's Doc doing here? Tell him, Doc. Um, I took the bullet out of Hank. He died soon after. What? That's right, Jake. Now, come down here where we can talk like friends, and I'll explain it to you. Stay where you are, boys. Yes. All right. All right, Doc, let's hear it. Well, they, they got me out of bed, Jake, and they led me out into the country. Hank had been shot in the back, and I extracted the bullet, but it was no use. He'd have died anyway. There were three men there, and I recognized one of them. Who was he? Well, I had to promise I wouldn't tell, Jake. Or they'd have killed me. That don't matter now. Now, think about that... it a minute, Jake. Doc gave him his word. And you're asking him to break it. Now, think about it for a minute. I'm thinking. Thinking about my boy, too. Hank's dead. You can't help him now. Shot in the back. And a coward who did it's run free. You want to help get him, Jake? Don't ask fool questions, Marshal. Of course I want to get him. Now then listen to me. Those men told Doc if he talked, they'd kill him. Yeah, and they meant it, too. All right, so I got an idea now, Jake. We'll spread it around that Doc has identified the killer. The news will reach him soon enough. In the meantime, I'm going to lay low. And I'll have Chester tell everybody that I've ridden out after them. Now go on. Then we'll just wait. One or two or maybe all three of them will come into Dodge to kill Doc some night soon. Yeah, you still might get away. And I'll deputize you and your boys right now and you can wait for them with us. 
You'll have to stay hidden like me, of course. Uh, we won't mind that. Not if we get a chance at them, we won't. All right, good. Yeah. Funny thing, though. What? man like Doc here, rather than break his word, he'll make himself a target for those killers? Yeah. Look, Jake, Doc and I are going to go back to Dodge now. I'll see that the story gets started, and in a day or two, you and your boys can ride in, but separately, though. Otherwise, it might cause talk. I understand. And come straight to Doc's. We'll get there. <laughs> next few days, Doc never left his office. I figured that'd make him look scared and draw the killers right into our trap. The rest of us sat around in his back room and waited. Chester kept us supplied with food and coffee, but we began to get pretty restless cooped up like that. And by the fifth night, we were being real careful with one another and over polite. But on the sixth night, about midnight, we got our game. Mr. Dillon, I think it's them. Where? They just rode up Hunt Street, three of them. They're tying up outside right now. They acted too deliberate-like for ordinary riders, so I run up the back way to tell you. Doc, come on in. Uh, what do you want me to do, Matt? Take cover in here and stay out of sight. Yeah, whatever you say, Matt. Let's go downstairs and meet them, Marshal. No, we might just scatter them that way. Mm. Now listen. One of them will probably stand guard on the street while the other two come up here to get Doc. Chester, you and the two boys go down the back way. Jake and I will wait in the Doc's office. But don't jump that man till we go into action up here. Do you understand? I got you. All right, then move fast. Come on, Jake. Now what? Well, we'll just wait here in the dark. Good. I'll fix Doc's blanket on the couch here so they won't think he's in it. They're on the stairs now. All right, get back in the corner, Jaker. We'll be shooting each other. All right. Yeah. Quiet now. And don't start shooting till I do. Doc, wake up, you lying oh, dog. Don't just shoot him and get out of here. What? Wait. He ain't here. What? Get your hands up. You're under arrest, both of you. It's a I... trap. You all right, Jake? I got one of them. I'm all right. Doc? Doc, you can come on out now. Uh, yeah, all, all right, man. They're dead. Light the lamp, will you, Doc? Uh, all right. Yes, you bet, Matt. Uh, light the lamp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, come in, Chester. Where we got him, Mr. Dillon? He tried to get away when he heard you up here, but he ran smack into one of the Worth boys. He's dead. Yeah. Well, I don't know either one of these men. Doc, you can tell us now. Is one of these the man you recognize? Uh, let me see here. This one here. I remembered later I treated him for a broken nose some time back. I never did know his name, though. He, he came up on the, uh, up the trail with a herd, I think. Uh, it don't matter now, as long as they're all dead. <laughs> oh, well, <clears throat> bring the other bodies up, uh, Chester. I'll do the autopsies quick, and I'll get them out of here. <laughs> it's about time I got something out of all this. Okay, Doc. I'll fetch him. Well, Jake, uh, I'm satisfied, Marshal. Me and the boys will be getting back to the ranch now. Sure. Marshal, uh, I... Yeah? I doubted you. I'm sorry for that. Forget it, Jake. No. No, it's best I remember it. Man shouldn't make mistakes like that. Well, there was no harm done. The way it worked out. Uh, I'll buy you a drink before we leave, Marshal. <laughs> I think I'd like that, Jake. Come on, let's go.
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner with Lawrence Dobkin and Harry Bartell. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This is Roy Rowan speaking over the CBS Radio Network. Gunsmoke starring William Conrad with the episode titled Word of Honor from January 10th, 1953. Next up on Classic Radio Rewind, we will hear from Lou Parker and Francis Langford in The Bickersons. In the first show in the new series, John has bought a diamond ring for Blanche as an anniversary present and winds up in jail, accused of being a cat burglar. So from June 6th, 1951, this is the Bickersons with the fatal anniversary present. And now, the Bickersons. The Bickersons, produced and broadcast, transcribed from Hollywood, starring Miss Frances Langford and Mr. Lou Parker. Together they will portray the lead characters in Philip Raff's humorous creation, The Bickersons. And as the battling John and Blanche, they will bring you an unretouched picture of domestic tranquility. But first, here's Lou Parker as Lou Parker. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening. I'm quite sure you're all waiting to meet that gracious young lady who has earned the undying love and gratitude of our boys both here and overseas for her tireless efforts in still another role. Here she is, the Purple Heart Girl, Miss Frances Langford. Thank you, Lou. Frances, before we put the gloves on for our Bickerson stint, I have a little favor to ask of you. Anything you want, Lou. Well, it isn't for me, although I'm sure I'll enjoy it. A couple of weeks ago, when you were entertaining the servicemen at the Long Beach Veterans Hospital, one of the boys fell in love with you. Only one. <laughs> well, this one's doing something about it. He's written a letter to you asking that you sing a song especially for him. His name is Terry Amico of Ward N3. And the song he'd like to hear is Blue Skies. Okay, Francis? <laughs> Nothing would give me greater pleasure. So with the help of Tony Romano and his orchestra, this is for you, Terry. <laughs> Never saw the sun shining so bright, never saw things going so right. Noticing the days hurrying by, when you're in love, oh my, they fly. Blue days, all of them gone, nothing but blue skies from now on. Never saw the sun shining so bright, never saw things going so right. Noticing the days hurrying by, when you're in love, oh my, they fly. Blue days, all of them gone, nothing but blue skies, no more gray skies, nothing but blue skies from
The Honeymoon is Over. In the Bickerson bedroom, there is an infernal machine. With the persistent, inexorable ticking common to all time bombs, it gradually approaches the hour that will shatter the ears and destroy the happiness of the unsuspecting John. It's a matter of seconds now. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I wish I was dead. All right. All right. All right. Blanche. Blanche. Wait a minute. I'm putting a ribbon in my hair. Where are you going? I'm not going anywhere. Just thought I'd like to look nice for this morning. Why? I knew you'd forget. You did forget. Today happens to be our wedding anniversary. I didn't forget it. Then why didn't you say something? I just opened my eyes. Well, we've been married eight years. What do you want to do? Nothing. It's too late now. <laughs> You got any plans for tonight? Sure, I got it all worked out. I'm going to take you to dinner on a burlesque show. No, you're not. I'm having a party tonight. Then what did you ask me for? Where's my pants? Somebody stole my pants. Nobody stole your pants. I just looked under the bed and they're not there. Here are your pants. Thanks. Blanche, these aren't my pants. Then whose pants are they? That's a good question. Only I should be asking it. <laughs> Don't be so funny in the morning. They were baggy, so I pressed them. Baggy. Hand me my tie. Which one? Doesn't matter. I want to use it for a belt. My suspenders are broken. <laughs> Why don't you use your belt? I'm using it to keep the soles from falling off my shoes. John figures in your shoes. I are... know it. I haven't got a belt. Where's my shirt? Your coffee's getting cold. I don't want any coffee. Where'd you hide my shirt? Didn't hide it anywhere. Well, where is it? I draped it around the canary's cage. Is my shirt the only rag you can find to cover that cage with? Hasn't hurt it any, has it? No, but I don't like the way that bird pokes into my pockets. <laughs> Every time I take a cigarette out, I'm smoking bird seed. Why do you have to cover the cage anyway? The canary is sensitive to light. Well, get him a pair of sunglasses and leave my shirt alone. Why must you be so mean on our anniversary? Blanche, I'm not mean, I'm worried. I haven't sold a single vacuum cleaner for four weeks. You sold one on Thursday. I know, but we bought it. I had to sell something to keep from getting fired I'd like to take it back, Blanche I can't make the payments on it You leave it alone We'll need it when we get a carpet Okay <laughs> Bye John What? I've been standing here waiting for you to kiss me goodbye And you haven't even looked at me I looked at you <laughs> What do you mean by that? Nothing, Blanche, I'm late Wait a minute, you got any money? Well, there's a quarter in the sugar bowl A quarter? You can bring me the change when you come home <laughs> Now, listen, Blanche, something's got to be done about this. I can't get out of work like a pauper every day. A man's got to have a couple of dollars in his pocket. Well, don't yell at me. Well, I don't mind going in torn clothes, holes in my socks, but I'm not going to suffer through those lunches anymore. What's the matter with your lunches? You ought to know. You pack them for me. <laughs> Just getting sick of carrying my lunch to work in a paper sack. Why can't I go to a restaurant like the other fellas? Why can't John, I order a... what are you talking about? I haven't fixed your lunch for two years. Oh, Blanche, every morning of my life, I find my lunch wrapped in brown paper on the side of the sink. Lunch? That's the garbage. No wonder nobody wants to swap sandwiches with me. <laughs> Goodbye, Blanche. Goodbye, dear, and happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, dear sister. Oh, thanks, Clara. Where's Barney? I'm here. Clara, it's getting late. Why don't you tell her? Tell me what? Barney can't come tonight. He's been invited to a masquerade party at the United Nations Pool Hall. <laughs> you know, his friend's place. No. Tell her already. Well, anyway, he wants to go, and it's sort of a hard times party. Everybody's going dressed as a bum. What are you telling me for? Well, I thought maybe he could borrow some of John's clothes. <laughs> well, that's a nice thing to say. Barney, come away from that closet. Why can't I borrow this old gray suit? Them, them raglan shoulders are way out of style. Oh, I forgot about that suit. John never wears it. It just hangs there. You can have it, Barney. Oh, thanks. The boys will get a kick out of those open-toed pants. You coming, Clara? In a minute. Blanche, I wonder if you'd mind lending me your vacuum cleaner. Well, I can't do that, Clara. It's never been used. It's still in the box. Oh. Well, what's the matter with John's sample? 
He's using it for demonstrations. How do you suppose he sells his vacuum cleaners? With his disposition, I'll never know. <laughs> Good morning, madam. I'm from the Eagle Appliances. Paying a call in answer to your oh, letter. Oh, I'm that you... sorry. You're 20 minutes late, and I've got an appointment at the dentist. Well, you see, I'll only take a few minutes I of your time. I can't wait. I'm getting my bridge today. But, but I just want to see you about... I'm sorry. Not now. I've got to get to my dentist. <laughs> what good are teeth if your house is dirty? <laughs> oh, well. How do you like that? Five o'clock, and I haven't even got a foot in the door yet. Well, this is my last call. I'll have to high-pressure this one. I've been giving up too easy. Good afternoon, sir. I represent the Eagle Appliance Company, and I'm about to give you a, your wife a demonstration that will simply amaze her. My wife being home. Well, no matter. If you'll just follow me into your living room. Hey, get out Ah, of here. here we are, and a charming room it is, too. Look, now then, let's just empty these ashtrays on the floor. What are you doing? The wastebasket is full, too. Well, well, we just scatter this junk all over the place. Listen, you cut that out. Now, don't be alarmed, sir. Now I'm going to go over this rug just once. Oh. And if this vacuum cleaner doesn't pick up every single last speck of this filth, I'll eat it. Well, you better start eating, mister. Our electricity's been shut off. <laughs> oh, hiya, Dickerson. Your wife just called. Yeah. It's your anniversary, huh? Yeah. What's the matter? Forget to get her a present? I think I got her one present too many. Picked up a couple of cheap things at first, then I got sentimental and bought her a diamond ring. A diamond ring? On time. Nothing down and $10 a week for life. <laughs> Three weeks behind on the first payment. <laughs> Say, listen, Mom. Oh, no, no, you don't, Dickerson. I got no money. And if I did have any, I wouldn't lend it to you. You still owe me $4. I know that, Nothing but after... Nothing doing. If you need money, sell a vacuum cleaner. Hmm? Yeah. Sell a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Say, so how much will you give me on this vacuum cleaner? Does it work? Oh, it's brand new, right off the shelf. It's worth 115 bucks. Give me 20 and let me get out of here. Well, all right. Uh, you wait here. I'll go make out the ticket. Fine. Headquarters. Uh, this is the Argyle Pawn Shop. I think I've got the man you've been looking for, the cat burglar. <laughs> oh, it was a wonderful anniversary party, Mrs. Bakerson. Too bad John couldn't make it. Well, I can't understand it, Dr. Hersey. He's never been this late before. Well, I wouldn't worry about it. He probably got tied up with some tough customer. Probably. Good night, Doctor. Thanks, officer. I'll be over in the morning to claim the vacuum cleaner. Please make sure they take my name off the police blotter. Vickerson, what happened? Oh, hello, Doc. Nothing. It's a long story. I'll tell you about it some other time. Well, I certainly enjoyed your party. Happy anniversary. Thanks. Oh, uh... I didn't want to tell your wife, Bickerson, but I left a little something for you on the hall table. Well, thanks. You needn't pay it until the 10th. <laughs> you can mail it in with last month's bill. Or if you pass the office, drop in. Drop dead. <laughs> oh, I'm out on my feet. I'll probably be up all night answering Blanche's questions. What a life. If I tell her the truth, she won't talk to me for a week. So, I'll tell her the truth. The Bickersons have retired. Blanche Bickerson lies tense and sleepless in the dark as poor husband John, tortured by the guilt of having missed his own anniversary party, suffers another attack of intermittent insomnia, or woodchopper syndrome. Listen. Sounds like he 
you swallowed the thing. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. John, mm. turn over on your side. Go on. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop it, Blanche. What's the matter? What's the matter, Blanche? Whining and giggling and grunting and snorting is driving me crazy. Me too, Blanche. Who's doing it? <laughs> You're doing it. It amazes me that you can sleep at all with your guilty conscience. Not guilty. Put out the lights. I will not. I've got plenty to say to you. Blanche, what's the matter with you? It's three o'clock in the morning. You had a good time tonight. Now, why don't you let me sleep? I had a miserable time. It was the unhappiest anniversary I ever spent. Why didn't you show up for the party, John? I told you, I got stuck at the office. Funny, nobody else got stuck. And everybody who came tonight was sweet and thoughtful, and they all brought presents. Good. That's more than you did. The Homers were here, and they brought something. The Hyde's were here, and they brought something. Even my sister Clara was here. What did she take? <laughs> she didn't take anything. And if she didn't bring a present, it's because she can't afford it. Barney isn't working. He never works. He does, too. It's just that he's recovering from his accident. What accident? When he was out looking for a job last month, he tripped over a barrel and two cases of bourbon fell on his head. It was the first time the drinks were ever on him. <laughs> Go to sleep, Blanche. You said you didn't have dinner. Why didn't you eat something when you came home? There wasn't anything left. Well, who told you to come home so late? Clara took what, what was left of the ham and Dr. Hersey cleaned up the spaghetti. I gave Nature Boy the rest of the chicken. Who's Nature Boy? Our cat. Did I hear him yell when you came in? I stepped on him. Well, what'd you do that for? I was fighting him for the chicken bones. <laughs> what do you mean, what did I do that for? It was dark and he got under my feet. You never liked that cat. I like him fine. Just keep him out of my way. You hated the other cat we had. Which other cat? Shiners, the big black one. Shiners? You know, the one you said committed suicide after you caught him drinking your bourbon. <laughs> he did commit suicide. I'd love to believe that. What are you hitting at, Blanche? Cats have been known to commit suicide. They don't hang themselves. <laughs> he didn't hang himself. He got his neck tangled in a ball of twine, and I was trying to loosen it when you walked in. Now, don't start making me into a cat killer. A man who could forget his own anniversary is capable of anything. I tell you, I didn't forget. Not even a card. The least you could have done was send me an anniversary card. I did send you a card. I told you 50 times I sent you a card. Must have got lost in the mail. Swear you sent me a card. I swear. It was twim, twim with lace and it had a wonderful poem on it. I picked it especially for you. What did it say on it? Go to sleep. <laughs> Well, if you picked it especially for me, I want to know what it said. It said, happy anniversary to my love. That could be anybody. Let me finish. It said, happy anniversary to my love. My wife, my life, my turtle dove. Life with you is great, it seems. I love you more than pork and beans. <laughs> You're only adding insult to injury. Well, how do I know what it said? I can't remember the stupid poetry they put on those things. Put out the lights. You torture me every year on our anniversary. Oh, dear. Am I so old and homely that you can't show any affection or sentiment? trouble with you is you're tired of me. No, I'm just tired. Good night. <laughs> Look at George Wood. There's a wonderful husband for you. He's been in love with the same woman since the day he was married. Does his wife know about her? <laughs> Never mind the thought, Cat. If you didn't have those evil thoughts, you'd make a better husband. I'm not a demanding wife. Mm. All I ever ask from you is a pleasant smile or a kind word. Wake up, John. What do you want? Say something nice to me. I love you. I adore you. I can't live without you. Now shut up and go to sleep. <laughs> scream at me on our wedding anniversary. You'll just keep quiet for a while. I won't scream. I'm going to talk whether you like it or not. I don't like it. Don't forget, Mr. Dickerson, I gave you the best years of my life. Are those the best? <laughs> Leave it up, John. Night after night, I go to sleep crying into my pillow. It's soaked through from my tears. And one kiss would make it all perfect. Well, throw over your pillow and I'll kiss it. <laughs> you see, you're starting again. Is it asking too much for you to be nice to me once a year? I'm always nice to you. You never are. You're perfectly horrid. You'd never have a single argument if you'd just be, give me a little attention. Well, nobody gives you as little attention as I do. <laughs> well, I'm surprised you admit it. You never take me anywhere. You never show me the slightest consideration. What consideration? Don't I offer you half the newspaper every morning at breakfast? 
You shouldn't read the, read the table at all. When you drive the car up in front of the house, you might be a gentleman and help me in. Help you in? Oh, no, I have to fling open the door and throw myself onto the seat. Well, I slow down, don't I? <laughs> Oh, I'd like to see you act that way with Gloria Gooseby. Now, don't start with Gloria Gooseby. You'd sure be a gentleman if you had her in your car. I've had her in my car plenty of times, and I've never been a gentleman. What? And I mean, I hate you. I wouldn't let her ride on my running home. Why don't you let me sleep, Blanche? We've had eight anniversaries. This is the most miserable one of all. It's no worse than last year. Our whole marriage started on the wrong foot. It was your idea to elope, not mine. Yep. I wanted to have a real ceremony like all my friends, but you said it was more romantic to elope. We had to be married by the justice of the peace. Should have been the secretary of war. <laughs> didn't talk that way then. Why didn't you let me have a big ceremony, John? I wasn't working at the time. I didn't have any money. Well, you're working now, and I want a real wedding with a big ceremony. Okay, I'll arrange it next week. You say it, but you won't do it. Do it now. What? Go on, get up and let's get married. Are you out of your mind, Blanche? It's almost four o'clock in the morning and I have to go to work at seven. Why do you do this to me? Haven't I suffered enough for one day? You haven't suffered half as much as I have. I go to all the trouble of making an anniversary party and you deliberately stay away. It wasn't deliberate. Why don't you say you're sorry you married me? Because I'm not sorry. Not at all? Not at all. Do you hate me? You know I do. What? I mean, I don't hate you. <laughs> please let me sleep. Well, I will as soon as you show me the anniversary present you got for me. Put out the lights. Where is it, John? Hmm? Where's my anniversary present? No, you won't like it. It's just a little old beach bathrobe. It cost eight dollars. Eight dollars? Our eighth anniversary, and that's all I'm worth to you? Eight dollars? Now, listen here, Blanche. A dollar a year for washing your shirts, cooking your meals, darning your socks, raising your children? We haven't got any children. Well, what do you want for a dollar a year? <laughs> Blanche, all I want is sleep. I'll get you something nice tomorrow. You told me that yesterday. Today's my anniversary. Why couldn't you get me something nice today? I did, Blanche. I did get you something, but I can't give it to you now. Go to sleep. What did you get me? A diamond ring. Wake up, John. I'm still talking to you. I'm not sleeping. I really bought it for you. A diamond ring? Yeah. Where is it? What's the difference? I can't afford it. I'm taking it back in the morning. I don't believe it. Show it to me. Right there in the closet, in the pocket of my old gray suit. Your gray suit? You mean the one I gave Barney? That's right, in the left-hand pocket. The one you gave to Barney? Glad you didn't! Don't get hysterical. I emptied out the pockets. The stuff's on the dresser. There wasn't any ring box. It wasn't in a box. I tied it in my handkerchief. Oh, thank heaven. Here it is. Oh, John. It's beautiful. It's got to go back. Take it off. <laughs> Such a lovely diamond. Take it off, Blanche. Look at it. I've seen it. Take it off. Here. Well, it's nice to know that you were thinking of me anyway. I'm sorry, Blanche. I did want you to have it, but you could see how impossible I it is. Know, I know, dear. You've got enough debts now. It was a wonderful, foolish gesture, and I love you for it. Keep the ring, Blanche. <laughs> Don't be silly, John. You can't afford it. Keep it. Enough. I'll find a way to pay for it. I'll get an extra job or something. Don't worry. Go to sleep. John, mm. you can be so sweet when you want to. Mm. I'm so happy. This feels just like when we were first married. You were so kind and considerate. You do love me, don't you, John? Yes, Blanche, I love you. Good night. I remember our first anniversary. You were so upset about something, and I kissed you goodnight and tucked you in bed like a baby. In the morning, everything was fine. Go to sleep, Blanche. John... Would you mind if I just tucked you in bed tonight? Okay. Tuck me in. Lift your head, dear, so I can straighten the pillow. Now, let me get these covers under. Mm. <laughs> Stretch out your feet. Uh. There, that's it. Now, all tucked in. Thanks, darling. Are you comfortable, sweetheart? Perfectly. Are you sure? I never felt more comfortable in my life. Fine. Now, you get up and tuck me in. <laughs> Good night, Blanche. Happy anniversary, John. Now, here are John and Blanche Bickerson as Francis Langford and Lou Parker. 
Well, Francis, that puts the lid on number one. And I might add that I couldn't think of a more pleasant way of spending a half hour than working opposite you. <laughs> Why, thanks, Lou. I think you do a pretty good job yourself. I think so. Let's hope the listeners <laughs> agree with us and that they'll be around next week for another session with the Battling Bickersons. And the honeymoon is over. Good night, Francis. Good night, Lou. Good night, everyone. <laughs> The Bickerson, starring Francis Langford and Lou Parker, is another worldwide presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. was Lou Parker and Francis Langford as John and Blanche Bickerson with the episode titled The Fatal Anniversary Present, as originally heard June 6, 1951. And with that brings hour number one to a close, but we have an action-packed hour number two coming up. So don't touch that dial as Classic Radio Rewind will return right after these very important words. Welcome back to Classic Radio Rewind. I'm Barry Slinker, and coming up this hour, we have a Rocky double feature. Starting off first, we have an episode from Rocky Fortune starring Frank Sinatra. Rocky's good friend Ellie is fat 40 and frustrated. She marries a low life and is soon murdered. From January 5th, 1954, this is Rocky Fortune with Murder by Marriage. Frank Sinatra. Transcribed as Rocky Fortune. NBC presents Frank Sinatra, starring as that footloose and fancy free young gentleman, Rocky Fortune. Hi. You know, it takes a real artist to get real involved. And brother, when it comes to that art, I'm the original Mike Angelo. But I gotta admit, I ask for it sometimes. This was one of those times. I was mad. Mad enough to dream this rack of mine up to seven feet of steel. Maybe I was just a lox looking for a bagel blanket, but some smooth creep put a permanent curl on my lip. It's not tough to understand when circumstances puts a guy on the wrong road. Slums make monsters out of a lot of good citizens, but when a creep uses education, money, and a decent background to give him a background of crime, 
This is real slime. This guy wasn't even domestic. We imported him. I met this here gentleman when he was going with the sister of one of my neighborhood buddies. Her name was Ellie. She was fast, frustrated 40, but it wasn't her fault. She spent her manhunting years looking after five brothers and, a, and sisters and heating the Saturday night bath water on the stove of the cold water flat. I didn't know there was a guy in the picture till we were talking one night. Rocky, you got a good head on your shoulders. What do you think I should do? What's with this Dorothy Dix jazz? Do about what? Well, now that all the kids except Sammy are married, I'd, I'd like to get married, too. You mean Ellie's got a fella? Didn't you think it was possible? Oh, come on, honey. I'm kidding. Who said it wasn't possible? The guy who gets you is real lucky. Only I didn't know there was a guy. Who is he? Where'd you meet him? I... I, I, I can't tell you, Rocky. So you picked up a guy. That's something It's wrong? not that I never picked up a man in my life. Only it's not easy for a girl my age to meet eligibles. I, uh... I answered Nad. Ellie, you fell for that routine? So why not? There's some nice refined ads, you see. Most of them are like me, Rocky. They're lonely. I figured I'd maybe meet a nice widower who wanted somebody to look after him. But you asked me what I thought. Does that mean you met somebody? That's right, Rocky. Rocky wants to marry me. Well, how come your brother Sammy never mentioned this? Doesn't he know about it? No. No, Rocky, and, and, and don't tell him. I, I know already what he'll say about Elmer. About who? Oh, now, don't you laugh, Rocky. His name is Elmer, Elmer Broff. Ouch. I met him through an exceptionally well-worded ad. And I consider myself very fortunate... And if you're going to make fun of me, I'm sorry I ever burdened you with my problem. Oh, now, honey, take it easy. Ellie, you know I love you like you were one of my own. Only you should talk this over with Sammy and let him meet this guy. Sammy has nothing in common with Elmer. They, 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 they speak different languages. What does this guy talk? Hindustan or something? He happens to be a, a, a very cultured and, and refined gentleman. So what's a cultured, refined gentleman with so much on the ball doing advertising for company? What's the matter with him? He's lonely, Rocky. But like I'm lonely. You you make people laugh. You got charm. You you got lots of friends. You don't know what it's like to sit and have a conversation all by yourself. You you sit and you talk to yourself, and and then you realize that no words are coming out. It's, it's only your mind can hear you. And you. And you start thinking maybe you're losing your mind. It's a horrible thing to be lonely, Rocky like having a hole in your heart. Sure, I, I guess maybe I got a hole in my head, not my heart. I'm sure he's a wonderful guy, Ellie. Sure. I guess you ought to marry him at that. Thanks, Rocky. Thanks for telling me that. She thanked me for advising her to marry him. That was almost funny. Because I found out a lot of things after that. For example, I found out why she didn't want to tell Sammy and have him meet this Elmer. Ellie knew she shouldn't marry him. She was afraid Sammy would talk her into being sensible. She didn't want to be sensible. She just wanted to be married. So Ellie got her fella and got married. Sammy wasn't too happy about it. Six months later, he got the real reaction. Do you know what that sound is? That's a man crying. Crying his guts out. You know what it's like to sit and listen to a grown man? A guy you grew up with tear himself in two. And nothing you can do about it. Just sit and torture yourself. Bleed. And cry inside with him till finally you can't stand it any longer. Stop it, kid. Come on, stop it. I can't. Rocky. Rocky, I, I can't. I can't help it, Rocky. What's in you, kid? What is it? it it's Ellie, Rocky. <laughs> Ellie's dead. <laughs> uh, 
I'll give you the details just like the lonely Mr. Fancy Pants from abroad gave it to the coroner at the inquest. We'd been out visiting some friends. My wife had been kind of quiet all evening. Usually she only takes a single drink. This night she had four or five and they, they seemed to depress her. When we arrived home, she said she had something on her mind and wanted to drive and think it out alone. Since it had already been a most unusual evening, I didn't question it. I was tired and had a few myself, so I fell asleep immediately and, and slept quite soundly. I, I found her in the morning. Evidently, she had driven into the garage and fallen asleep at the wheel with the engine running. It must have been an accident. It was no accident. Ellie didn't drink. <laughs> This court finds the deceased, Ellie Bruff, came to her death on the night of December 2nd by inhaling carbon monoxide fumes. Death was accidental. There was no accident. He killed her, I tell you. He killed her and I'll kill him. All right, easy, easy, kid. Come on, Sam. Quiet. I finally got the kids sat on, but the damage was already in. Anything happens to Mr. Fancy Pants, and the kid is booked solid for a one-way trip to Sing Sing. I make coffee time with him and try to bring sense to some plan. I only know one thing, Rocky. Ellie gave her whole life to raising us kids. For herself, she had nothing. All she knew was work. Take care of the house, go to the movies once a week. Rocky... Sure, sure she wound up with a few grand after the kids got married. She had herself a time. I know that, Sam. I know your kids were her whole life. And if anything happens to you now, that means she wasted her life. The other kids got families, Rocky. They, they can't take any chances. Ellie was all the family I had left. Ellie's dead. And he killed her, Rocky. The law don't say that, kid. The law says it's an accident. And unless you got proof... You gotta go by the law. I don't need proof. She was my sister, Rocky. She was all I had. This creep killed her. I got nobody left. Nothing more to lose. Rocky, I'm gonna get him. I'm gonna get him. Two things told me the kid's words were Emma's. The look in his eye and the bulge in his coat pocket. Sammy was a fighter and a rough-and-go kid, but he never packed a heater. So I had to get to Mr. Fancy Pants and get him to leave town before Sammy killed him. I knew Sammy would take the subway downtown and take the train out to the island where they had their house. Me, with my no-expense account, had to beat him out there. A 15-cent phone call could maybe save me four bucks taxi. I invested. Hello? Elmer, this is Rocky Fortune. Glad you called, Rocky. I feel very badly about Sammy. It's it's horrible enough that Ellie is gone, but can't you possibly convince Sammy that it was an accident? That's why I'm calling you, pal. I can't convince Sammy. We better do some talking right away. Well, that's fine. Can you come out here? Wouldn't do any good. You're having company, and you better not be home when the company gets there. What do you mean? I mean Sammy's on his way out, and he's liable to want some target practice for the heater in his pocket. You could be the target. That's all I had to say. Twenty minutes and one speeding ducket later. It's open. I got here as quickly as I could. I noticed. Sit down and listen to some news, Mr. Broff. Tune in real close because there ain't going to be a second time. I'm awfully sorry to do it, Rocky, but if, if Sammy actually has a gun, I should be forced to go to the police for protection until I leave town. Where are you going? Well, I, I don't know yet, the... Too many memories around the house and around the town. You know how it is. You know, Elmer, somehow I got no tears for you. I think you're a rotten liar. You got Ellie's insurance, you're selling the house, and you're blowing town. A nice, pretty, convenient package. So you think as Sammy does. Don't put words in my mouth, Mr. Broff. I'm liable to spit them back at you. And I'm getting mad. I'm getting real mad just looking at you. You just gave me the whole bit. I think Sammy's right. What would a fancy pants like you want with a 40-year-old sweetheart like Ellie? Why would you marry her? I married her because I loved her. Nice try, but no cigar, Mac. You married her for the 10 or 11,000 bucks you're in line for. I won't bother denying anything to you. There's no reason why I should. Ellie's case is closed by the police. 
And aren't you real lucky? So Ellie's case is closed, and off you go with the loot. Let's just get a repeat performance on what happened, huh? I already told you the entire story to the police, and the case is closed. I just now opened it, Mr. Bruff, and I just might open your head. Take your hands off me. Stop making with a Shakespearean drama. I'm only making sure you're sitting in that chair and not running to the cops. Not till you satisfy one question that bothers me. There's no reason for me to have to satisfy you. It hurts that I should have to disagree with such a distinguished man, but sit still or I'll beat your brains in. Well, what do you want to know? Now you're getting smart. In my head, I've been running over the details. Now, in the first place, like Sammy says, Ellie never went much on the liquor kick. And even if she did get loaded and did fall asleep in the garage with the motor running, who closed the garage door? What? I don't remember that it was closed. You told the coroner at the beginning of the inquest that it was closed. Yes, I, I suppose I did. So I get a picture of Ellie getting out of the car, closing the garage door, getting back in the car, and falling asleep. Something's wrong with that picture, pal. Well, I didn't want to bring that out, but it, it bothered me, too. I, I know what happened, but I didn't want to harm Ellie's memory. She, she must have committed suicide. Why didn't the cops say that at the inquest? I no idea. There's, there's no use digging that up, Rocky. You can, you can only harm Ellie's memory. The man's worried about Ellie's memory. That's real touching. It also stinks. That felt real good. That felt right. Get something straight, Rocky. I can defend myself. You better get something straight, buddy. If I'm right, you're going to have to. I'm not going to sit here and have myself set up either as a punching bag for you or a clay pigeon for Sammy. I'm getting police protection while I'm in town. If you go near the cops, I go to the insurance company and tell them you told me Ellie committed suicide. There was a double indemnity on that policy, and I'll bet you collect double because it was ruled an accidental death. What do you want me to do? That's better. I'm calling the shots now, Mr. Fancy Pants, and I'll level with you. I tell Sammy nothing because if I do, he's sure to kill you. That helps nothing. You're going to remove yourself from the local scene as of right now. And I'm going to get you, mister, and I'm going to do it nice and legal. I want you in one piece and very healthy. I'm going to see to it that you get an extra special crew cut and a draped shape with a slit pants leg. We got no case now, but one day you're going to be happy to turn yourself into the cops. Because that's the only way you'll ever get away from me. Make your plans, mister. Play your traveling music because you're traveling fast and I'm walking behind you. While Fancy Pants gets set for his trip, I call my pal, Sergeant Hamilton J. Finger of the local Gestapo. He verifies what I already know. You need fact to hold a guy for murder. The cops don't play hunches. He gets one bright idea, and he figures the pattern is pretty set. Could be Bruff worked the same gimmick back in the old country. He'd run a make through Scotland Yard. Finger reminded me of something else. If Mr. Bruff is a killer, I stand to lose something mighty important to me. Namely, my life. With the financial aid of those who lose their heads easily, I'd get set to travel. Bruffs buys the drawing room to Los Angeles two days later. Figuring I'm as good as him any day, I buy the same style. Two days later finds us leaving Chicago. I keep low at first and then accidentally on purpose just as he's ordering dessert in the diner. How do you spell cyanide, pal? I want to order some dessert for you. What's the idea, Rocky? I told you I was working a mustard plaster deal on you. Figured it was time I showed. What do you want now? I want to know how you got Ellie so loaded that she sat still while you killed her. I, I didn't kill her. I know you said that. She committed suicide. Ellie actually committed suicide when she married you. Only you helped to get to the burying stage. Now, look, Rocky, I'll make a deal with you. You're, you're a young chap. You never had too much money. If, if you call off this insane chase, I'll... I'll give you $5,000. Five grand. I'm flattered. So you're that afraid of me? Get something through your head, Rocky. Physically, I'm not afraid of you. This much, I'll admit. I married Ellie because I needed the money, her money. I may even have made her slightly unhappy. Unhappy enough to commit suicide. I may even have made her suicide look accidental so I could collect on the double indemnity. But you have proof of nothing. Now be clever. Take the 5000 do you know what Sammy would do to you if I ever repeated this conversation to Well, you? you won't do that. You protected me against Sammy simply because you knew he'd kill me and would have to pay for it. In the eyes of the law, he would have killed an innocent man. 
I wonder what would stop me from killing you. I hate you enough to carve your guts. You better be careful, Rocky. I may just grow to hate you that much, too. That's when I was sure I was looking into the eyes of a cold-blooded murderer. And he was looking into the eyes of the guy he wanted most to kill. Hey, that's me. Like a flash, it came to me that for a change, I was running off of the mouth much too much. The next stop the train made found me making a collect call to one sergeant finger. As soon as I heard the call was collect, I knew it was you, Rocky. You still with Bruff? Like chewing gum on a baby, only I got a feeling I may be sorry, Finger, this guy's a killer. I know. How long a stopover were you are? Only a couple of minutes. Why? Well, never mind now. There's no time. Listen, I just got word back this guy's wanted in more countries than money. Three dames had fatal accidents, and he was married to them when they had their accident. Now, we got orders to grab him right away. Now, I tell you what. You have the train held, get the police immediately, and don't you try anything yourself. What am I using for authority? My chicken inspector's badge? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And if he gets wind of anything, he'll skip. I'll tell you what. I'll rush a wire through to your next stop. It'll verify your story. When you get to Ogden, you show the wire to the authorities and have them hold them. Then call me. Now I'm working for the cops. What's with the loot, pal? Talk about that when you get back. If I get back. I was one nervous Joe when I got back on the train. Here I was back to back with a killer. And I set myself up as a kingpin in his bowling alley. I spent my time keeping a make on my neighbor and my ear glued to the compartment wall between us. I'm concentrating on the sound next door so much and the lullaby of the rail starts ushering in the Sandman. I fight to stay awake. I lose the fight. A little later, I shake myself awake, happy that I still can. A telegram from Finger. This I need quickly. I could have slept through the delivery, so I ring to find out. Yes, sir, Mr. Fortune, there was a telegram for you. Where is it, son? Well, I started to knock at your door, but the man in the next compartment said you were asleep and didn't want to be disturbed. My neighbor told you that? That's right. He said I had a telegram in my hand and... And you gave him the telegram for me? Well, I always see you both together, so I figured it would be okay. By now he knows the whole story. Did I do wrong? Man, you just gave me a one-way ticket to paradise. Only who wants to be an angel? I'll go get the telegram from him. Ah, by now it's in pieces. Where are we? How soon do we get into Ogden? Almost there, sir. About ten minutes. Happy to see you up and about, Rocky. Yeah. I'm tickled to death myself. Let's get some air. Who needs it? Excuse me, sir. I got some things to take care of. We both need it. For a smart laddie, you make some stupid mistakes. Do you realize you've actually prodded me into killing you? Nice of me, wasn't it? Look, Brough, use that gun and you'll have the whole train on your back in a minute. Oh, I realize that. I also realize that if I get rid of you before we hit Ogden, there'll be no one to call the police. Most of the passengers are asleep and there'll be no one in the observation car. I don't need a diagram, Mr. Accident Specialist. <laughs> I didn't need a diagram. I was scheduled for a fall, and this time there wasn't even a dame involved. It was a short hike to that observation car, and he was right behind me all the time with a gun in my ribs. The trip back was uneventful. Didn't meet a soul and couldn't make a thing happen. Nothing there but a club car, a bar, and no drinkers. Suddenly, the rear door is open and my future has arrived. My future home, that is. Nestled between two shining steel rails with cinders for my pillow. The man finally made a noise. Turn around, Rocky. I said turn. That's it. Now start backing towards the guardrail. It happened. I saw it happen, but I didn't believe it. Drag him inside, boys. Yeah. Drag me with him, boys. I don't think I can make it alone. I don't know where you guys came from, but I'm sure happy to see you. Well, we've had the front, middle, and rear of the train covered since you left your last stop. We were hiding behind the bar when you walked through the club car. How did you know about it? Got a call from Sergeant Finger. He was afraid Bruff would try to kill you before you reached Ogden. We couldn't tackle Bruff while he had the gun in your ribs. When he got you outside, the noise made it possible to sneak up on him without being heard or seen. 
Why didn't that idiot finger tell me he was having a train boarded? I just lost ten years of my life. Don't be rough on that idiot finger, Mr. Fortune. His call saved your life. Yeah, get your antenna set to receive some news, pal. I love idiots. From here to eternity. <laughs> NBC has presented Frank Sinatra as that footloose and fancy-free young gentleman, Rocky Fortune. Others in tonight's cast included Paula Victor, Tom McKee, John Sutton, Barney Phillips, Jay Loft Lynn, and Maurice Hart. Tonight's script was written by Norm Sickle. Andrew C. Love directed. to tell you about next week's adventure, here's Frank Sinatra as Rocky Fortune. Next week, I'll tell you about the time I got hired by the Rodeo just before someone shot the boss and rustled the gate receipts. I ended up with a six-shooter in my back and an invitation to be guest of honor at a Western fashion show, modeling an 18-foot necktie made of rope. If you're a driver who likes to travel at night because the highways are less crowded than in the daytime, you're courting danger and should be extra careful. Although fewer cars travel the roads at night, the death rate per vehicle is four times greater at night than in the daytime in proportion to traffic volume. If you must travel at night, use the utmost caution. Most of all, slow down from your normal daytime driving speed. The two biggest factors causing an alarming increase in night accidents are bad driving vision and excessive speed. Safety experts say that more than 20 million motorists have bad driving vision at night. About 3 million have vision so bad at night that they are dangerous when they drive. Now, you may have the vision of an owl after dark, but your number may be up if you drive too fast or become involved in an accident with one of these drivers with extremely bad night vision. Avoid driving at night, whenever possible, and at all times drive as though your life depends on it. It does. Visit with Fibber McGee and Molly tonight on the NBC Radio Network. That was Rocky Fortune with Murder by Marriage, as originally heard January 5th, 1954. And last up on Classic Radio Rewind is our other Rocky, Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles. The show follows the adventures of Rocky Jordan, an American who runs the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo, Egypt. Each week, Rocky finds himself entangled in various mysteries and adventures, often involving crime, intrigue, and exotic locales. In this episode, Paulette Martin has disappeared, leaving behind two X-ray plates of the recently deceased Dr. Markov, So, from August 27th of 1950, here is Rocky Jordan in Dr. Markov's Discovery. Now, we bring you a world of adventure with... Rocky Jordan. I was sitting alone in my cafe tambourine when Paulette Martin came to my table. I remembered her from three years back. She was the kind you remember. But now she seemed scared, said she was being followed. Paulette showed me a large manila envelope, said what was inside was worth a lot of dough. I thought she was just playing cops and robbers for the excitement of it, but when she made a private phone call for my office and didn't come back fast enough, I got that old feeling that it was going to be one of those nights. I made for my office on the double. Paulette Martin was gone. She'd left the manila envelope with me for safekeeping. I tore it open. Inside were two x-ray plates. Down in the lower left-hand corner was the name Dr. Konstantin Markov. Then I remembered what I'd seen in the newspaper just an hour ago. 
Dr. Konstantin Markov had been found at 10 that morning in his office on the Sharia Romar. He'd been knifed to death. On a narrow street, not far off Cairo's native quarter, stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Dr. Markov's Discovery. I slipped the x-ray plates in my desk drawer and walked around to the door leading into my cafe. A small gray-haired gent in a derby hat was standing at the bar. He was watching me over the rim of his glass. Then his mouth moved slightly. The two men who stood on either side of him with their backs to me turned slowly, leaned against the bar, peered at me through the smoky haze. Then I noticed a cabbie pushing his way through the crowd headed in my direction. His eyes skipped around the cafe as if he were looking for somebody. As he came up, he took his cap off, started twisting it in his hand. A thousand pardons. You are Mr. Jordan? Yeah. I, I, the young lady I drove here in my cab, I believe she said she was coming to see you. What about it? Uh, she told me to wait, Mr. Jordan. She said she would only be a minute, but already... Now she's gone, uh, friend. Gone? But no, she did not pay me. She owed me 50 piastres. She promised to give me 50 piastres. All right, all right. Your evening won't be a total loss. We can do business. Your cab outside? Yes, yes, Mr. Jordan. A fine automobile. An excellent automobile. A wonderful... Okay, you sold me on it. Yeah, this will do as a retainer. I may need you for a little while. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll be out in a minute. I figured I'd check on why the x-rays were worth so much dough first. I went back into the office, picked up the x-rays, and walked out through the cafe. Three pair of very interested eyes followed me all the way. George, the cabbie, was sitting at the wheel of his hack, grinning from ear to ear. I gave him the address, and we drove off. A quarter of an hour later, I was walking along the 10th floor corridor of the Victoria Hospital, looking for a guy named Fisher, who ran the x-ray lab. After a series of left and right turns along the deserted, dimly lit halls, I finally pulled up in front of the x-ray lab. I reached for the doorknob. Then I heard it. Well, <laughs> it was a little late in the evening for x-rays, but I knocked anyway. I counted up to ten and opened the door. As I entered the lab, a door at the far end of the room closed silently. I walked over to a young gent in a white uniform who seemed to be very busy looking over some charts. Oh, hello, old man. Is there Fisher around? Uh, Fisher? Fi- uh... Oh, he beetled off about an hour ago. Won't be back tonight. Done in, you know. Completely bushed, is it were? Won't be back, eh? Are you his new assistant? Uh, no, no. I, I just pop over from med school now and then to uh, familiarize myself with the uh, equipment, shall we say? Yeah, take a look at these for me, will you? Oh, yes, of course. Of course, old man. Hmm. I'd say they were x-rays. What do you think they were? Navigation charts of the upper St. Lawrence River? Oh, yes, I see, I see. Hmm. It's rather interesting. Junior, upside down. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. I thought it rather odd. You see anything it... in him? Uh, no, no, I, I don't, old man. Awfully large stomach, though, really. Must be a very fat old thing. Yeah, hand him over. Really, old man, I must confess I'm not too familiar with this sort of thing, actually. However... All right, all right, never mind. Uh, however, on the second floor, Dr. Kingston... Yes, I know. See you later. Uh, I say, old man, that's not the way out. That's the door to the closet. <gasps> and good night to you, too, sweetheart. I say, old Junior, man. you should know that nurses aren't allowed on this floor. Not even the pretty ones. Good night. Oh, and uh, wipe that lipstick off your collar. I went back out into the hall with the x-ray prints tucked under my arm and started for the elevators. But I didn't make it. Halfway down the corridor, a door opened suddenly. An arm shot out and I caught the fist in the side of my head and down I went on the cold white marble floor, listening to the footsteps hurry away down the corridor. I hadn't blacked out entirely. When I got to my feet a few seconds later, I looked around for the x-ray plates. They were gone. I hurried over to the elevators. Only one of them was in operation, so I started down the stairs. On the first landing, I bumped into them. I stopped. They stopped. There were three of them. 
Two tall, heavy-set gorillas flanking a small, slim gent with a derby hat. The characters I'd seen earlier in my cafe. Then the little guy reached for his hip pocket. Instead of a gun, he brought out his wallet and started up the stairs toward me. You alone. You will come with us, Mr. Jordan. Well, you'd have to make me a good offer. Maybe a set of pickle dishes, huh? Perhaps, uh, perhaps this will persuade. I am Colonel Bukhar of the Istanbul Police. My credentials. Ah, Istanbul, huh? You're a little out of your territory. What's the matter? Take the wrong streetcar? Shall we go, Mr. Jordan? Mind telling me where? You have a choice. A choice? Yes. Police headquarters or the morgue. When we got to police headquarters, Sam Sabaya was standing in the hall next to the water cooler. He and the colonel got their heads together for a moment, and then we all walked into Sam's office. The two gorillas stationed themselves at the door. Sam dropped into his swivel chair. The colonel started pacing the room. He seemed a little disappointed. So you know this man, Jordan, Captain Sabai. Yes, yes, I know him, Colonel. Very well. Better luck next time, Colonel. It appears that he and the girl, uh, Paulette Martin... Ah, a woman. Yes, I might have known. I followed her to the cafe. This uh, cafe at... Um, um, Tambourine. Yes, as I was saying, Captain, I followed the girl to the cafe. She turned over an envelope to Jordan. Then Colonel. She... Yes? She didn't turn it over. She left it in the booth. And then she went into your office. Is that right? Yeah, she went to make a phone call. When she didn't come back, you I... You followed her. Later, you came out with the envelope under your arm. Sure. I went over to the Victoria Hospital. And... What happened to her, Jordan? I don't know. She ducked or somebody grabbed her out of my office. What were you and the girl up to, Jordan? Look, I hadn't seen Paulette Martin in over three years. Tonight she waltzed into my place with an envelope and gave me a pitch about joining her in some deal. What sort of a deal? She didn't get around to tell me. She went to my office to use the phone, and that's the last I saw of her. Jordan, what was in the envelope? Oh, a couple of x-rays, Sam. X-rays? What sort of x-rays? Just plain x-rays. Some guy's stomach. A st- Jordan, this is no time. Sam, I'm telling Wait, you. Just a moment. Uh, Jordan, where are... Are those x-rays? I don't know. Somebody grabbed them away from me at the hospital. Uh, huh. so somebody took them away from you, huh? Just like that. <laughs> the x-rays, Jordan, were they from Dr. Markov's office? But, yeah. And the patient's name, it was also on the x-ray? I, uh, I don't remember. Look, would you mind telling me something? Uh, what is that? Why are the Istanbul police so interested in this routine? You do not know, of course. A lot of things I don't know about this, including why a guy's stomach is so important, how Paulette Martin got mixed up in this deal, and why she came to me. Just a minute. You did not know that Paulette Martin worked in Dr. Markov's office? No, I didn't know that. She was his receptionist. But, of course, you would not know now. You said you had not seen her in the last five years. Three. Yes. You still haven't answered my question, Colonel. Why is the Istanbul police interested? I don't intend to. Perhaps Captain Sabaya will tell you if he's so inclined. At the moment, I have work to do. Uh, Captain, I would like to talk to you for a moment uh, in private. Uh, Yes, yes, of course, Colonel. And with that, the Colonel's two boys eased me out of the office into the hall. We sat down on the bench and waited. Ten minutes later, the door opened and the little Colonel strutted out. He didn't even look at me as he went past. His two boys jumped up and trailed after him down the hall and out into the street. And that was that. I walked over to Sam's office. Sam was in his chair again. Come in, Jordan. Look, Sam, I love that guy, but what's he doing down here? Cairo's in Egypt, not Turkey. It concerns the murder of Dr. Markov. Sit down, Jordan, sit down. Okay, shoot. About a week ago, Dr. Markov sent a wire to the Istanbul police requesting information of a very clever and dangerous convict named Brezak. Brezak? He died about five years ago, didn't he? Well, yes. After his escape from prison in Istanbul, he was drowned in the Black Sea. But there was never any positive proof that he actually was dead. The body was never recovered. So now, five years later, Dr. Markov, here in Cairo, suddenly starts asking questions about Brezak. What's he want to know, Sam? Merely if there was a possibility that Brezak was still alive. Nothing more. The Istanbul police replied to the wire by sending down one of its prized bloodhounds, Colonel Bukhar. Yes. But when Colonel Bukhar arrived, he found that Dr. Markov had been murdered. Mm. What's Paulette Martin done to put the gleam in the little colonel's eye? Mm, Nothing. 
I'm convinced she had nothing to do with the doctor's death. However... However, the colonel doesn't go along with the idea, huh? That's right. And now, <clears throat> Jordan, the patient's name and the x-rays. What was it? Oh, Griswold or Grisholm, I'm not sure. The first name was Jonathan. And the address stops me. There were some threes and sevens, but I can't straighten them out. All right, Jordan. So if there's nothing further, I'd like to go back to my cafe. Yes. Yes, of course. Thanks. Oh, and thanks for straightening things out for me with a hotshot colonel, Sam. I went back out into the street, and there was George, the grinning cabbie. He wasn't going to lose a paying customer if he could help it. Ten minutes later, we pulled up in front of 3337 Sharia Kubri. The guy who lived there was named Kashubian, and he tried to sell me a rug. Next, we tried 3733. It was a small shop and closed for the night. Number 3737 turned out to be an empty lot, so we mushed on. A little later, we pulled up in front of 7337 on the classy side of town and hit the jackpot. It was a two-story brownstone house. The native houseboy led me into the library where I met Mr. Griswold himself, all 280 pounds. He was sitting behind a desk, a napkin tucked under his chin, gnawing on a drumstick. In his other hand was a piece of celery. Come in, sir, come in. Dominic, a plate for the gentleman. You'll uh, join me, sir? Yeah, thanks, no. no. Glass of wine, then. Dominic, a glass for Mr... Uh, uh, Jordan. Uh, Jordan. Jordan. What is this? Pleasure, sir. Pleasure. Now, sit down, sit down. You'll excuse me. No, yeah, I... go right ahead. Nothing like a bit of bird and a bottle of fine wine before retiring and all. So you won't join me, huh? No, thanks. Well, then. Now, Mr. Jordan, to what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? Dr. Markov. Oh. Dr. <clears throat> Markov. He's dead, sir. Just this morning. I read about it. Sad. Yes, I know him. He took some x-rays of you recently, didn't he? X-rays? Yeah, indeed, sir. Indeed he did. But how did you know? Well, a doll named Paulette Martin waltzed into my cafe tonight. She said they were worth a lot of dough. Any idea why? See here, Mr. Jordan. Is this some sort of a... Uh, excuse me. I don't think so, Griswold. I took the x-rays over to a friend of mine at the Victoria Hospital. On the way out, I was slugged and relieved of the x-rays. I don't understand, sir. Why would anyone go to all that trouble for x-rays of my... My God, sir, it's preposterous. I must say I don't like the idea of my... Excuse me, my stomach being battered about Cairo from pillar to post in this manner. No, sir, I don't enjoy it one bit. Rather indecent, don't you think? After all... All right, all right, Griswold, relax. I think I see the pitch. Sorry I bothered you. Uh, one moment, sir. I... <laughs> Pardon me. I want no more of that. Some other uh... time, Griswold. I'm in a hurry. See you around. <laughs> I went back out into the street. George, the cabbie, was sitting on the front steps of the house waiting for me. We, we were successful, Mr. Jordan. We were, George? We were. Now, do you know where Dr. Nuruddin lives? Dr. Nur the famous surgeon? Yeah, yeah. No, Mr. Jordan. But I'm sure you will have no difficulty. So am I, George. Okay, hoist up your patees and let's away to the nearest telephone booth. If anybody would know about unusual x-rays, it would be the surgeon, Nuruddin. At 9.45, I was ushered into his study. At 10 o'clock, Dr. Nuruddin and I had a glass of sherry, and at precisely 10.15, I left with a small pencil sketch he had made. It was the kicker to the case, and I tucked it safely away in my breast pocket. Five minutes later, I put in a call to Captain Sam Sabaya. Yes, yes, Jordan, what is it now? Uh, meet me at Dr. Markov's office in 10 minutes, Sam. I'll tell you all about it then. Oh, and bring the key. Just a minute, George. Bring I'm... the key, Sam. Bring the office key. <laughs> Sam was already standing at the entrance to the small office building in the Sharia Romar when I got there. We went inside and started across the lobby. Well, Jordan, what is this all about? Oh, it was a sucker play from the start, Sam. A little Paulette started it. The x-ray plates she slipped me were phonies. It dawned on me while I was talking to Griswold. Griswold? Who is Griswold? The guy with a stomach. But he doesn't figure. Now, see how this shapes up. Paulette Martin has the real plates. And she's holding on to them, see? Mm -hmm. When the doc gets bumped, she gets scared, figuring she's next. Mm -hmm. To throw the murderer off her trail, she picks up a phony set of plates from the office, Griswold's, and waltzes into my cafe with them. I see. Now, sure, while the murderer's trailing me, Paulette slips away with the real plates. Mm -hmm. oh, here is Dr. Markov's office. Now, what do you want in here, Jordan? Fast browse through the good doctor's files. Oh, 
Oh, hold it, Sam. What's the matter? Somebody's coming up the stairs. Come on, let's get out of sight. A few seconds later, a woman came into the corridor. It wasn't Paulette Martin, and she stopped in front of Markov's office. She stood there looking at the name on the door, raised her hand slowly, and gently brushed the gold lettering with her fingertips. Then she opened her purse, took out a key, unlocked the door, and went inside. Hmm. I wonder what she's doing here. You know her, Sam? Yes, her name is Anita Loman. She was Dr. Markov's nurse, came back from Alexandria this morning in time to discover his body. How'd she take it? Uh, badly. I think she... I think she was in love with the doctor. Huh? You sure she was in Alexandria last night? Oh, yes, yes. We checked it. Come on. Nurse Loman was standing before a filing cabinet with half a dozen manila folders in her hand when we walked in. She turned slowly, then gave out with a thin little smile. Oh, Captain Sabaya, I'm glad you're here. Good evening, Miss Loman. Uh, this is Mr. Jordan. Miss Loman? How do you do, Mr. Jordan? Captain Sabaya, when I spoke to you at headquarters this morning, I, I, I was terribly upset. Yes, I, yes, I know. I, I don't know why I didn't think of it before, but... Well, the shock of finding... Finding Dr. Markov. You have uncovered something, Miss Lomond? I believe so. It suddenly came to me this afternoon. I was trying to find some reason why... why anyone would want to take Dr. Markov's life. And then I suddenly remembered. The day before I left for Alexandria, a man went in to see Dr. Markov. They were in the doctor's private office for quite some time. This man sounded very angry. He, he seemed to be after some X-rays. Go on, Miss Lomond. This man's name, do you remember? I, I'm not certain. If I could only find the files, they they seem to have been rearranged. Yeah, I'd say the murderer took care of that. What did he look like? Oh, he was slender, middle-aged. I saw him only twice the day he was brought in, but... A was... moment, Miss Lamont. You say he was brought in? Yes. It was late afternoon. There was an accident in the street. This man was hit by an automobile. He wasn't seriously hurt, though quite dazed... After he was brought in, he complained of pains in his head. And Dr. Markov took x-rays? Yes. A short time later, however, the man seemed perfectly normal. Doctor sent him home and told him he'd be around to see him that evening. If I could only find those x-rays... Oh, I... you won't, Miss Loman, but... Uh, here, take a look at this. Would the x-rays look something like this? I took the piece of paper Dr. Nouradine had given me out of my pocket and spread it out on the desk. On it was drawn the head of a man in profile. Directly behind the ear at the base of the skull was a small area shaded in red pencil. The girl began studying it. Jordan, where did you get this paper? Dr. Nouradine. You've heard of the surgeon, haven't you, Sam? I went over to see him before I called you on the phone. He drew this sketch for me, describing an operation that was performed over 12 years ago in Prague. An operation? Yeah, on this guy, Brazak. Now, this was several years before he went to prison. Brazak was hurt in a hunting accident. His family had a lot of dough, and they hired a surgeon from Vienna. This is his work, Sam. Uh, Mr. Jordan, this shaded area behind the ear... That's a silver plate, Miss Loman. Brazak has a silver plate in his skull. Colonel Bukhar didn't mention that to you, did he, Sam? Uh, how did Dr. Nuradine know all this? Well, the operation was widely discussed years ago. It appeared in a flock of medical journals. Seems there was a little criticism here and there. The operation wasn't too successful. It wasn't? But Brazak... Oh, sure. Brazak pulled through okay and resumed his role as playboy of the Balkans. But the plate gave him trouble from time to time. Nothing serious. You say all this took place before he went to prison. What did he... Well, he got mixed up in a little deal in Istanbul later. Politics and the death of a countess named Montclair. Brazak was sent to prison for life. He'd only served a few years when he escaped and was supposed to have drowned in the Black Sea. Well, then, Mr. Jordan, does this mean that this man Brazak is still alive? That you're able to identify him by this, this silver plate? If we had the x-rays, this piece of work could probably be identified as easily as if the surgeon had signed his name on the silver plate. That's what made your Dr. Markov send the wire to the Istanbul police requesting information of Brazak. Now, if we had the x-ray plates with the patient's name Look, on it... Look, Sam, we're wasting time. There's still an outside chance we can grab Paulette Martin before she skips. Perhaps she doesn't intend to skip. All right, we'll try both angles. <laughs> Sam got to work on the phone and told his boys to cover the airports, train, and bus depots. From Nurse Lomond, I got half a dozen addresses where Paulette might be holding in. Sam picked out three addresses and raced off in the police car. Armed with the other three, George, the cabbie, and I took off. 
George and I connected on the second address, a small three-story apartment house alongside the Dorchester Tower building. Paulette was just coming out of the apartment house when she saw us. She had a good head start, and by the time we pulled up, she ducked into the tower building. When we raced into the lobby, a scrub woman was standing there with her hands on her hips, muttering to herself and looking up the stairway. Mr. Jordan, this way, up this stairs. Look, George, I'll take the stairs. You grab one of the elevators. Go up to the top floor and work down. You get it? Yes, yes, I understand, Mr. Jordan. It was rough going by the time it hit the sixth floor. I could hear Paulette above me racing up the stairs. Then I stopped. I couldn't hear her anymore. I eased up to the seventh floor slowly. On the next landing, I found her shoes. Paulette was doing better now in her stocking feet. On the tenth floor, I ran into George. Mr. Jordan, did you see her? Ah, the, the dame runs like a deer. Come on, George, let's go back up. She must be up there. Perhaps the roof, Mr. Jordan. It is possible... Yeah, to... yeah, come on. When we reached the roof, it was deserted. We eased up the tower and directly under the huge clock. At the head of the spiral stairway was a door. We walked into the small room. The light was on, but the room was empty. As we started to turn around, the door slammed shut. We were locked in. Mr. Jordan, the ladder there. Perhaps we can get above. Okay, George, you try it. I'll see what I can do on this door. Yes, yes, there must be some way. For an instant, I didn't know what had happened. The shock had jarred the room like it was built on a plate of jello. Then I remembered we were directly under the huge bell of Dorchester Towers, Cairo's version of the Big Ben. I shook the sound out of my brain and looked at my watch. Quarter to twelve. Then I looked over at George, the grinning cab driver. He wasn't grinning now. He was flattened out against the wall, his face gray with fear, and there was a wild look in his eyes. Mr. Jordan, we must get out of here. We must get out of here. Yeah, yeah, relax, George. We got 15 minutes before the bell opens up again. 15 minutes? 15 minutes? Yeah, it's quarter to 12 now. Midnight, we're in for another session. Unless we can... No, no. We must get out of here. Well, I was in favor of that, too. But I didn't see any reason to get so excited about it. George scurried up the ladder and tried to open the trap door. It didn't budge. I went to work on the other door with my knife. All I came up with after ten minutes was a couple of broken blades. George kept clawing at the trap overhead, but he wasn't getting anywhere. He was like a wild man now. The minutes ticked by. George threw both hands over his ears and crouched in the corner of the room. Then it hit again. Yeah! George dropped to his knees, shook his head, then staggered to his feet like a drunken man. He fell against the wall, covered his face with his hands. A ribbon of blood trickled down the corner of his mouth, and he started clawing at the side of his head, digging his nails into the scalp just behind the ear. Then I realized that he was the gent in the x-rays. George the cabbie was Braysock, the gent with a silver plate in his skull. And right now, the vibrations weren't doing him any good. George! George! Get me out! Get me out of here! I can't stand any more of it! What do you want me to do, Braysack? I don't know. I don't know. Get me out. Please! Oh, stop I can't stand any more. Do something. Okay, Braysack. You talked me into it. tapped him with all I had on the point of the jaw, and he went limp. Brazak didn't have to worry about the bell anymore. In a moment, Rocky Jordan returns with the ending to tonight's story. When Republicans and Democrats, labor and capital, rich and poor, all agree, that's news. And they do agree on at least one subject, The Miracle of America, a free booklet available to everyone. Write for your free copy and learn why being an American is the greatest gift mankind knows today. Address Miracle of America in care of the CBS station to which you're listening for your free copy of the vital and informative booklet, The Miracle of America. Write today. And now we return you to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. I took the rest of the midnight sonata, and a few minutes later, the door to the tower opened. Sam was standing in the doorway. At the other end of the handcuffs was Paulette Martin. Well, that's the way it ended. When Paulette found out that Brezak was using an assumed name... 
she got the idea she'd blackmail him for the plates. Brazak, thinking Dr. Markov was in on the deal, went over and killed him. Paulette got scared and came to me, and you know the rest. I went back to my cafe, and a couple hours later, Sam showed up in my office. He was wearing a grin from ear to ear, beating out the hotshot colonel for the capture of Brazak, alias George the Cabby, had done it. Have a cigar, George. Speak up, will you, Sam? That pounding I took with a bell may be a little hard of hearing. Have a cigar, George. Oh, thanks, Sam. <laughs> colonel Bukhar is not very happy about the way things turned out. What did you say? I said, the, the colonel is not very happy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Looks like the local boys beat him out of a feather in his cap. Huh? <laughs> oh, yes. And, of course, there is also a small matter of a reward. A what, Sam? Every... Never mind, Jordan. I will see you later. Oh, uh, Sam. Yes? I mean, yes? Uh, about that reward, don't bother sending me my share. I'll be down to headquarters to pick it up. Good night, Jordan. Good night, Jordan. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Now, here again, with a brief word, is Rocky Jordan. Friends, I'm just another American, but one who lives almost halfway around the world from home. Believe me, there's no better way of learning to appreciate the American way of life, like being away from it. It's those who grow up with it, live with it, and have come to accept its benefits, who like to be reminded once in a while. Well, a little booklet came in the mail from the States this morning. I read it through in less than half an hour. But since then, I read it a dozen times over. Its title is The Miracle of America. In those brief 19 pages... I learned more about what the American way of life means than anything I ever read before. It's straightforward, deals with facts, and it's endorsed by both management and labor. I wish everyone inside and outside America could read it. I'm sure it'll make a real impression on you. Best of all, this booklet is yours for the asking. Just write your local CBS station and ask for the miracle of America. All it takes is a penny postcard. Include your own name and address for mailing. Nothing more. Remember, address your own CBS station and ask for the miracle of America. Do that tonight, huh? Before you have a chance to forget. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. Same time, same station. And the story is Ace High Straight. Rocky Jordan, written tonight by Adrian Jando, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with... Jay Novello as Captain Sam Sabaya. Original music composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell. Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. was Rocky Jordan in Dr. Markov's Discovery as originally heard August 27th, 1950. I'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back to Classic Radio Rewind. One final reminder that coming up this Saturday, September 21st, over on our Old Time Radio USA streaming channel, we will present our annual WJSV, A Day in Radio History special. WJSV, a Washington radio station, recorded an entire day of programming, capturing every moment from 5.58 a.m. sign-on to 1 a.m. sign-off. This was captured on 38 lacquer discs, which were later preserved by the National Archives. The unique aspect of this special is the programming you will hear from that day. You'll hear radio programming and shows that are not found in the old-time radio world. You'll hear program series that you've never heard before. You'll hear news from that day and much more. So, join us this Saturday the 21st with a 5.58 a.m. Eastern Time start time. Only Old Time Radio USA will bring you this unique historical broadcast in its entirety. Next week on Classic Radio Rewind, we're going to hear from the fat man, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, John Steele adventurer, and the man of steel himself, Superman. All of this next week, right here 
on Classic Radio Rewind. Don't forget to share Classic Radio Rewind with your friends and family and click subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any of the fun that is the golden age of radio. And with that, brings this week to a close. I'm thrilled that you're able to spend just a little time with me each week, and my hope is that these two hours that we do spend together each week can help you get away from the world for a little while. The stress that is everyday life or work, and that we can go back to a more simpler time and let these stories from a bygone era take you to another place and time, even if it is just for a little while. And with that, I hope you can join me next week for another two-hour journey into the golden age of radio. And until next week, for Classic Radio Rewind and the WOTR Radio Network, this is Barry Slinker saying goodbye for now. Classic Radio Rewind is a production of the WOTR Radio Network. For more Classic Radio Rewind and to listen to any of the WOTR Radio Network stations, go to www.wotrradionetwork.com.